Okay. I think I'm going to start. All right. Shall I start the introduction now? Um, Steph, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, you can start, please. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rebecca Wong, and I serve as director of the Silly Center on Aging. Welcome to the Lefevre Hughes Winter Series on Aging now in its 29th year. The series invites speakers who are nationally and internationally recognized gerontology research educators, basic scientists, clinicians, and social scientists. Today, we salute our audience in person in the conference room at UTMB, as well as audience online. One special feature of this winter series is that our audience includes members of the general public from the Galveston community as well as from our scientific groups and healthcare providers. This series honors Dr. Edward James Lefevre and his daughter, Dr. Nancy Lefevre Hughes. Edward Lefevre joined UTMB in 1940 as a professor of medicine where he served for 48 years. He was an early strong proponent of elder care and the study of aging at a time when few doctors were prepared to care for older patients. His daughter, Nancy Lefevre Hughes, began her career as a nurse and after more than a decade, decided to become a physician. Nancy passed away tragically two years ago. She was well known in the Galveston area for her compassionate care and dedication to her patients for more than two decades. We honor her and we miss her dearly also as Nancy and her husband, Mike, make time regularly to attend these winter talks and interact with us. Now I will turn to introduce our speaker of the day. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ken Ferraro. He is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and served for 20 years as Director of the Center on Aging and the Life Course in Purdue University in Indiana. He is a sociologist who is recognized for his myriad contributions in the field of social gerontology. Over the last three decades, his work has influenced meaningfully our collective thinking that health and the way we function in old age has its origins in the past, in our childhood, adolescence, or young adult years. Ken has influenced the importance we now give to what is called the life course approach in our studies of aging. You will hear more about it in his talk. Dr. Ferraro has published prominent work in hundreds of peer reviewed papers with colleagues, mentees, and students, more notably on a variety of aspects of the different stages of life and their impact on well being in old age. But all along, he has written important reflection pieces for scholars in our field. For example, I remember reading a piece he wrote called A Half Century of Longitudinal Methods in Social Gerontology, reflecting 20 years ago on the contributions of the Journals of Gerontology, Social Sciences. We have appreciated this kind of reflection work. In particular, Dr. Ferraro's ability to look from the high levels and indicate new directions for our field. Dr. Ferraro has received multiple awards in recognition of his professional impact, including most recently from the Gerontological Society of America, the 2023 Award for Distinguished Career Contribution to Gerontology in the Behavioral and Social Science section of this prominent scientific society. Before turning the microphone to Dr. Ferraro, we ask that the online audience ask questions on the chat place of the live stream, and those in person will be able to ask questions using the microphones that are distributed in the room. Dr. Melissa Morrow will be in charge of monitoring the Q&A traffic in the room. Welcome, and thank you, Ken, for making the time to talk to our groups today. Please go ahead with your presentation.
Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, it's a very gracious introduction, and I appreciate you as a colleague and as a center director. I know that role well, and uh, you are doing a great job at Sealy Center. Thank you. It's a true pleasure for me to be with you today and to discuss disparities in the life course origins of dual functionality. I'm honored to be able to give this lecture in this August uh, series. And I'm going to talk about can always be boiled down to three things. And my outline is before you. I'll talk a little bit about the life course origins of adult health disparities. I'm going to then use the concept of dual functionality as a novel concept and a measure of health. And I'll conclude with some empirical work in progress related to these topics. I'd like to also acknowledge some people and some institutions. And I really have to just pause for a moment and honor my colleague, Cocos Marquides. He is a remarkable scholar of the first rank. Uh, you look at all the metrics of H index and citations and what have you, and uh, Cocos stands head and shoulders above most of us. He is not only a remarkable scholar, but he's also an incredible mentor. He has a gift of hospitality. I've seen it in operation many times. And I just want to say thank you to Tokos and for all that you have done, uh, standing up the Journal of Aging and Health from scratch. You built a wonderful journal. Uh, your, your students and your postdocs, they really think the best of you, and that's a great sign. Thank you, Cocos. Also like to thank the National Institute on Aging for its support of this research and Purdue University. Yes, I love my university. It's a great place, and my career has very flourished there, so I'm very grateful. And some of what I'm going to present today is really collaborative work. So I want to acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors, all Purdue personnel, Sean Baldry, uh, Madison Sourtag Rolston, and Patty Thomas. Perhaps for this group, I need not spend much time talking about health disparities, but I'm going to anyhow. Health disparities are not just differences between groups of people in, in terms of their biological functioning. Rather, disparities refer to preventable differences in the burden of disease, function, and mortality. And that's the key uh, distinction here is that if we think of these uh, burdens of disease, function, and mortality, many of the differences are actually preventable. That is our environment, and our social life uh, influence the burden of disease. And we understand that some of these things are preventable. So what we're trying to do is think about how to measure the depth and the breadth of these disparities and then draw attention to how it is that we can intervene. You should know, and the evidence is just uh, voluminous, that there's striking health disparities in U.S. society. And I'll just use cause-specific death rates as one indicator to try to briefly summarize the gravity of the issue. Uh, whether we're talking about early life and pregnancy-related uh, uh, mortality, we see that Black and African Americans, American Indians, and Alaska Natives have some of the highest rates of pregnancy-related mortality. If we look at injury, we find that Hispanic Latino populations have high rates of injury related to mortality. And we can go on to many of the chronic diseases that we think of affecting middle age and later life, type 2 diabetes, very high rates for uh, Black and uh, American Indians. Uh, Alaska Natives, heart failure, again, uh, Black or African-American 
and Hispanic Latino have much uh, elevated rates of deaths due to heart failure. And even in Alzheimer's disease, we're seeing uh, tremendous disparities. So the question that many of us are grappling with, well, what are some of the ways that uh, social processes and social structures are related to these disparities and what can we do about it? A lot of the research uh, takes one of two different perspectives, I would say. Uh, very common perspective try to understand these disparities is the weathering hypothesis, the work of Arlene Geronimus. In her 2023 book, Weathering, uh, the subtitle really tells the story. The extraordinary stress of ordinary life in an unjust society. Her argument is that weathering is a process of exposure to elements that are going to be detrimental to human life. You might think of weathering in terms of the shingles on your roof. You might think of it in terms of, of wood or your car or other inanimate objects. We think of harsh conditions, extreme temperatures, either hot or cold. Uh, we think of storms and natural disasters. These things are consequential to inanimate objects, but they're also consequential to humans. And so what uh, Arlene Geronimus does is in a series of empirical studies, she documents the exposure to health risks that Black Americans face and then develops that into a thesis of accelerated aging. What's happening is that Blacks are, are aging at a different pace, at a different rate than non-Hispanic whites. This hypothesis has been very helpful for advancing research on health disparities. I take a similar approach, but uh, dis distinct in some regards from what we call cumulative inequality theory, where we want to uh, acknowledge the risks in the weathering hypothesis, but we want to focus on the accumulation of those risks over time, as well as the resources that are available to individuals for activation over the life course. Uh, we are not inanimate objects. You can talk about weathering in terms of inanimate or animate objects, but we're not. And so we give priority to resources to be able to counterbalance the stressors or the risks that people experience. And we also want to think about people having choices, constrained choice, but still human agency nonetheless. Sometimes in the most disadvantaged areas, as William Julius Wilson talked about, the truly disadvantaged inner cities with just tremendous rates of poverty and crime, et cetera, in the midst of those very difficult communities, there are people that are making great decisions about their health, protecting their family, working for noble ends. So what I think of is that exposure to health risk is very important, but so is this process of how we're going to respond to the things in our environment. Some of it we may not be aware of, that, that is toxic. Others, we are aware of it. But people have choices to make, and we can see it operate for those who are very disadvantaged and they make uh, good decisions and they compensate for the environmental challenges they face. Or we can also see it for people who are advantaged and, and uh, get intoxicated with their fame perhaps or their wealth. And we see many uh, individuals who suffer a health consequence as a result of that. Fundamentally, it's about stress. And what we think of in terms of the types of uh, health conditions that are con uh, associated with these stressors. Studies' contributions are that most 
when I look at the literature on the life course origins of disparities, that most of them examine specific diseases. And I raise my hand and say, I'm one of those individuals who's done them. So we did a series of studies where we looked at cancer, where we looked at heart disease and, and arthritis and various conditions. Uh, but I think the literature is ready for something more than just the sort of specific diseases. Those diseases may be related. Even if they're not related, there may be shared risk factors for them. Therefore, in this study, what we're attempting to do is to examine a more holistic measure than specific diseases. Secondly, the focus of much of the research has been on how stressors lead to disparities. There's far less attention given to how stress and resources can ameliorate the presumed sequela of stressful experiences. And I just think that we're, we're hungry for information to help us understand that we could chart a different path. The structure, social structures can be changed. Social processes are constantly in flux. And if we can identify those factors that can ameliorate these health disparities, uh, that's what we're going to do when NIH set out to reduce and then eventually said eliminate health disparities. So we hope to, to contribute to that literature. And then third, many studies examine racial disparities. I uh, published some of my first papers in the late 18 or 1980s, not 1880s, I'm not that old, but uh, uh, on racial disparities. But then we, we've been slower to getting uh, differences by ethnicity and nativity. And again, I tip my hat to Cocos and Rebecca and the colleagues at the Sealy Center who have really led the nation and the world in trying to better understand Hispanic health. And uh, I'm not in their, their uh, league, but I'm certainly interested in what they have to say. And they are showing the importance of not only ethnicity, but also nativity. Uh, many investigators want to broaden their investigation to include ethnicity, but I learned very quickly that nativity is also extremely important. There's so much health selection going on. So what is my more holistic measure? I refer to it as dual functionality. I call it a state of human existence in which people are free of both physical and cognitive impairment. Physical and cognitive impairment, free of it. Let me define this better by saying that dual functionality refers to being able to complete basic age-appropriate tasks. You can think about dual functionality across the life course, and we know that at certain ages, there are certain cognitive tasks that children just can't do, but at other ages, uh, as they grow older, we, most uh, adults are able to do that. So we want to think about age appropriateness of the tasks when we define dual functionality. Secondly, this definition does not have any requirement to be disease-free. And one of the, you know, very popular concepts out there is successful aging, but it's also one of the most uh, disputed concepts. And I need not go into all the details on that, but Rowan Kahn, their idea of successful aging was that you, people would really be free of disease. And I think it's more about function. Uh, if we've learned anything from Eileen Crimmins and others on the actual uh, hypothesis of the compression of morbidity, what we've learned is that we still have a high onset of a number of these conditions, but people are living longer with those conditions, which is remarkable. Uh, and so the focus on function is very, very important. Uh, dual functionality is not a measure of successful aging. I'm not trying to get in that competitive game of who's successful and who's unsuccessful at aging. 
I hope people don't tell me I'm unsuccessful at my aging, but I do uh, believe that dual functionality is important, but it's not a sine qua non of quality of life. Many, many people are lacking cognitive function or physical function and can have very, very high quality of life. But I do think that there's something special about individuals who are able to maintain uh, full functionality in later life. I just have to give some examples. I've always recalled the words of Harvey Stern, some of my professors said, what we need in gerontology, Ken, is we need more role models of how to age. So in the bottom left corner here, you might recognize the person there in John Glenn, an astronaut in 1962. A few of us were alive at that time and remember this man, uh, American, going into space, went on to have a, a uh, great career as a senator uh, in the state of Ohio. What some of us may not realize is that John Glenn went into space on uh, Friendship 7 in 1962, but he went back to space in 1998 at the age of 77. That's remarkable because to be an astronaut, you have to have tremendous physical and cognitive function to be able to do that. And most of us probably couldn't do it at half that age, but he did it at 77. And I, I think that's uh, remarkable. What the real miracle was, was that his wife of 50 years agreed to let him go back in space. His John and uh, Annie Glenn uh, were married in 1943. So they had their 50th wedding anniversary. And five years later, after the 50th wedding anniversary, the golden uh, anniversary, John goes back into space. Remark. Uh, this woman uh, took to uh, uh, a runner uh, by the name of Ada Thomas, who runs uh, five miles every weekday. She never ran her entire life, but when she retired at age 65, she decided to do something, so she took up running. Runs five miles every weekday, and for fun, she plays tennis on the weekends. Uh, this next person is a, a pole vaulter. I can't even imagine pole vaulting at, at uh, over 65 years of age, but this woman is in her 80s and is still pole vaulting. If you haven't been to senior games to uh, see these sorts of things, it's, it's well worth the, the uh, time to do it. And uh, here's another example, that sort of my, uh, one of my favorites for dual functionality. This is Bob Vollmer. He was born in 1918. He is a 1952 Purdue graduate in uh, the College of Agriculture, and he was a surveyor for the Indiana Department of Natural Resources until age 102. He adapted to the changing technology, but the point is that there are many, many people who are remarkable at this thing called aging. We don't have to call them successful or unsuccessful, but they are exemplars. And I think of dual functionality as an aspirational goal. Most people want to live a long life if they have their faculties. People discount years of a life marred by functional and cognitive impairment of pain, the words of Powell Lawton. Most people desire to live more years, but the quality of those years shapes how long people want to live. And I also think this concept is really easy to speak to others about because it's actually in our vernacular. They just don't use the term dual functionality, but you, you can fill in the blank. He is fine physically, but, and you know what someone's going to insert. They're going to insert something, but, but he has dementia. Or she, she has a great sharp mind, but she's no uh, longer able to get around without a uh, walker or something like that. So I think people, most people are thinking 
about the two functions. And that's the subject, uh, the outcome of our study. So again, uh, dual functionality is being free of ADL limitations and free of dementia. That's how we're going to define it in this uh, study. It's all it takes. You can have as many diseases. <laughs> it's not important. It's about function. And then in terms of stress exposure and weathering, I try to think of different types of exposures that people may face. And in the health and retirement study, we have a nice inventory of stressors that people have experienced. Um, off to the left-hand side, the childhood stressors. So HRS asks questions about abuse and financial strain and childhood exposures, what we might think of as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. HRS also asks questions about lifetime trauma. Uh, to watch a parent see the death of their child is probably one of the most uh, taxing uh, existential moments in a life, right? It's just a terrible thing to lose a child, uh, to be physically assaulted, uh, uh, attacked, you know, when you're or, or carjacked or something like that, any kind of face-to-face -face contact, lifetime trauma. We also included questions about everyday discrimination, where people might feel that they are treated with less respect for service in restaurants or in stores or with medical care. And on the right most are sources of discrimination. So rather than just pick one of these types of discrimination, we count up the number of uh, types of discrimination that people report so they could, if they had experienced everyday discrimination, they were asked, well, what do you think caused it? And ancestry, gender, race, uh, aging also is among those listed. So that's what we're trying to think of is, are these stressful exposures associated with this probability that one lives a long life with cognitive function and physical function? Our analytic approach in this analysis is twofold. One is we're going to just look at dual functionality at baseline. Uh, so we do logistic regression for that. And since we're interested in moderation by race, ethnicity, and nativity, uh, we're going to test potential interactions with average marginal effects using the first and second different approach. And then secondly, we'll uh, take loss of dual functionality over time. That is, we're going to prospectively track these individuals over 12 years and see who develops uh, dual functionality during this period of time. In the first analysis, that's for all individuals in our study because we're trying to just differentiate at baseline who has and who does not have dual functionality. For the second analysis, we're only taking the people who have dual functionality, and then we're using a Weibull accelerated failure time model to identify who experiences the loss of dual functionality earlier. We parameterize that based on the respondent's age. So let me tell you a little bit about the baseline results first, and then I'll turn to the longitudinal results. The childhood stressors and lifetime trauma were associated with uh, dual functional impairment, but there was no effect of discrimination. So childhood stressors and lifetime trauma, in spite of all the control variables that we used, had this staying power so that people who are 50 uh, uh, years or older in the health and retirement study these childhood stressors and these traumatic events are related to whether or not people have dual functionality at the beginning of the study. Secondly, education and wealth level the differences across race, ethnicity, and nativity. 
So on the left hand graph, this is about education. So on the X axis are the years of education from zero to 17. And this is the probability of impairment at uh, baseline. And you can see quite a spread here at the low levels of education. And then what do you see? You see convergence in these lines just by levels of education. So uh, for the blue line, light blue line here at the top, these are the non-Hispanic black. And the red line refers to the non-Hispanic white. And we have our two Hispanic born, US born and foreign born Hispanic somewhere in between. But the picture that you get here is that if you have higher levels of education, then the effects of these uh, stressors are not going to be as, as great. They're going to be reduced. A little different graph, but similar message for wealth. Again, the x-axis is going to be wealth. This is going to be the probability of um, lost uh, dual functionality. I did not have dual functionality at the baseline. And again, we, we start out seeing that the blue line is the highest, just like we saw over here with education, and the red line is the lowest. It starts out that way, quite a bit of variability here. But look what happens here is that this red line declines. All these lines are declining, but this at a slower pace. And we actually see that at high levels of wealth, the differences between white, black, and Hispanic persons really aren't are diminished or they're, they're leveled, they're shrunken. This is precisely what we're trying to identify is what are the factors that make a difference? And here we're focused on socioeconomic factors. In terms of the longitudinal results, we see that childhood stressors again are significant. So we had a uh, you know, various stressors considered and childhood stressors have a very strong signal with this notion of dual functionality. And we also observe that everyday discrimination was associated with earlier loss of dual functionality. So these analyses are more useful, I think, because we have causal ordering. And we know that these uh, X variables are predicting the occurrence of this uh, phenomena of this loss or this transition. And again, to see that childhood stressors are significant, again, really is just a testimony to the, to the uh, gravity of these stressors in early life. The effect of childhood stressors on the loss of uh, dual functionality was moderated by ethnicity and nativity. So high childhood stress was associated with much earlier loss of dual functionality among U.S. born Hispanics. This was really interesting to try to uh, ferret out what's going on. A high childhood stress associated with much earlier loss of dual functionality. This is the figure that uh, summarizes this. We're here, again, we're having stressors on the x-axis and high levels of stressors. And this is the median age. Again, this is not a probability, but this is the median age when people experience. So most folks with very low levels of stress are going to experience the loss of dual functionality at ages in the 80s and, and perhaps 90s. That's great news. But look what happens when we uh, track those individuals over higher levels of stress. Again, here are the non-Hispanic whites. These are the U.S.-born Hispanic, and these are the foreign-born Hispanic, and these are uh, the black individuals. So when we look at high levels of stress among Hispanic uh, peoples, we see uh, tremendous concern here in terms of uh, being able to hold on to dual functionality. Although education was not related to loss of dual functionality in the full sample, it was protective among uh, protective of uh, dual functionality among foreign-born Hispanic adults. Again, this is education. This is the median age at which people are experiencing dual functionality. 
These are the non-Hispanic whites. These are the foreign-born Hispanics. These are remarkable. So in terms of being able to achieve education after migration to the U.S. is a remarkable thing in and of itself. But it also could be selective uh, educational experiences in the migration phenomenon as well. When the uh, Mariel um, uh, evacuation from Cuba occurred, it was really the higher status individuals, physicians and lawyers uh, from Cuba who wanted to come to the United States. They saw an opportunity to make it there. And so perhaps that's part of what's going on here. But again, what we're seeing is that education makes a big difference in terms of this fundamental and holistic concept of dual functionality. We'll try to draw some common themes across these results and then uh, turn to your uh, comments on this work in progress. This is not published yet, so we're, it's work in progress, and I'm, I'm glad to get it. Now, first off, I think we see very clear signal. There's long-term negative influence of childhood stressors on dual functionality, and that's especially the case for U.S.-born Hispanic adults. That intrigues me. Why U.S.-born Hispanic adults? I, I guess I thought it would be more difficult for the foreign-born because they're transitioning cultures, uh, taking up a residency in a different land. But actually, it's the U.S.-born Hispanics that have the higher uh, uh, incidence of dual functionality loss. Secondly, discrimination is related to earlier loss of dual functionality among people 50 years of age or older. So this is actual evidence that discrimination is related to health, and it's not just to self-ratings of health. It's not just to, to one's mental health. But we're talking about the ability to hang on to one's physical and cognitive function. Discrimination precipitates earlier loss of dual functionality. Again, social structures, social processes have an imprint on our health. And this is one way we want to uh, see the influence. Third, resources can be life-changing. I've shown that to you with education and uh, wealth, socioeconomic resources. And in the sociological literature on uh, resources, we refer to this as compensatory leveling in dual functionality due to education and wealth. You might think that if, if you take a strict sort of cumulative disadvantage approach, that it's always going to be the people who are the most disadvantaged who are going to fall further and further behind. Cumulative inequality theory is a bit more complicated because we feel that it's more about resources and stressors rather than just exposures. Um, uh, the deal. Humans are not automatons. They make choices. They uh, draw themselves into networks that could be good for their health or could be bad for their health. But we see this compensatory leveling uh, due to education and wealth. As a professor at a public university, you know, I, I am aware of this uh, sort of unrest in American society as people are questioning the value of higher education. And there's actually some evidence that, that young people are, are uh, deciding not to go to college, not in huge numbers, but it is a small, you know, uh, but noticeable uh, trend of recent and could be in part due to COVID, et cetera. But you know, our research is showing that education is a truly powerful uh, resource not only for SES attainment and, and for prestige and higher paying jobs and better health insurance, all those sorts of things, but it's a powerful resource for longevity and what people think of as health span or dual functionality, where we're able to 
have the kind of lives that we're going to enjoy more uh, than we aspire to have. There are some limitations to this research. First off, uh, you know, I have retrospective measurement of childhood stressors. This is not the British birth cohort study where they actually had the stressors measured prospectively over time. Uh, rather, we're asking about childhood stressors. And the, uh, some people who have already lost cognitive function are unable to convey that information to us. So we, we are constrained to this sample. Uh, we have insufficient number of other ancestral groups, such as Native Americans and Asian Americans, in the HRS to actually do the statistical tests that we did for the four groups here defined by race, ethnicity, and nativity. And we focused on nativity differences, but we did not differentiate Hispanic people from Mexico, Cuba, Puerto Rico, other cultures. There's, there's a need for that kind of research, and, and I hope we we'll get a chance to do it. And I get to see it in my lifetime. In terms of next steps, we have another paper that's uh, under development, not quite as far along, but we're asking the question about social integration. Does it preserve dual functionality? So today I focused on socioeconomic resources. I think they're really important. I think education is a very accessible resource in a society like the United States. And uh, I just, I, I think that the, there's so much evidence that it's good for not only one's cognitive health, but also physical health. And with that, I'll uh, welcome your questions and uh, thank you for uh, some comments on this work in progress. My email is pretty straightforward if you would like to write to me afterwards, but I enjoy having the opportunity to chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ferraro. That was fascinating. So we'll open up the questions here in person first. Um, remember, if you're in the room, to push the button on the mic and hold it down until it turns green. Otherwise, he might not be able to hear you. So questions from the audience. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, um, uh, a very nice lecture. I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, uh, there are now uh, multiple examples uh, in which, like, for example, childhood stressors um, actually cause what are known as epigenetic modifications. Now, these are modifications to the DNA that is not mutation, but actually modification by methylation, for example. And then the histones on the DNA are also modified by lysine modification, so to speak. Now, the interesting thing about this is that it can occur in childhood, and these modifications are kept silently in, as that child grows up. And actually, um, they have now shown that these modifications again, are reactivated in adults and cause the various um, uh, syndromes uh, that we know in aging, for example. And the, the interesting thing about this also is that these epigenetic modifications can actually be trans transmitted genetically to progeny. And now there's a lot of work being done where the actually the sites at which the mod, the modifications on the DNA or the methylations on the DNA are actually identified and altered back to the juvenile state, and this uh, 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 also uh, permits the cells to be altered back to the juvenile state. Dr. Ferraro, do you have any comments for that? Yes. Yes, thank you so much for an uh, excellent uh, set of points. And I'm aware of such work that's being done on DNA methylation. I'm not doing it myself, at least not yet, but I, I'm a constant learner. But there are a, a number of studies that uh, support 
uh, the interpretation that you have given. And I hadn't seen so much on the transmission of the uh, epigenetic changes back to the next generation. That's really fascinating. And we've had for a long time, you know, the sort of model, the idea of the, for instance, the cycle of abuse in homes and domestic violence and what have you, and how kids end up doing some of the things that they saw their parents doing. So there could be a learning process going on there, but you're absolutely right. It could actually be that it is epigenetic as well. So there's a lot of uh, work to be done on identifying the specific mechanisms, but I think this is such an exciting time of research as we try to identify those mechanisms and the gravity of those mechanisms to uh, affect human lives. Dr. Ferraro, did you see um, similar, or do the, the relationships, are they maintained the same across men and women in your sample? We adjust for uh, sex in all of our models, and then it's sort of a practice in my lab that we torture the data till it tells us the truth. Uh, and so we we obviously make those tests with regard to uh, differences between men and women. And we do find, you know, some main effects, but we don't find that the influence it, uh, between the stressors and the outcome varies for men and women. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Ferrara. Um, why don't I step up here so you actually see me ask my question? I, uh, which, right there? Why one hand? Yeah, we oh, there can we see go. it now. There we go. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Farrar. Uh, yeah, I had a question. I, this this uh, concept of dual functionality is very interesting to me, and I was wondering if you had any sense of it's being driven by one part or the other. So are people typically losing their physical functioning first or their cognitive functioning first? And is that really driving the relationships that you're seeing? And does that relationship maybe vary by race? So. Maybe we were then to go back and look at or decompose it into the component parts of cognitive functioning and physical functioning, would the disparities necessarily look the same across races? Excellent question, Phil. And I uh, am pursuing that kind of research right now. So that's first we wanted to lay out the concept and to do some descriptive work. So we published a paper in the Journal of Gerontology Medical Sciences that just showed in terms of dual function life expectancy. So we created a measure that was comparable to what people do with active life expectancy or dementia-free life expectancy, but we put it together. So what we wanted to do was to establish the uniqueness, the remarkability of uh, people who have dual functionality at later ages. And now we are getting that question uh, well, which comes first? Is it the chicken or the egg? I've actually seen uh, evidence on both sides. Uh, the the uh, Georgia Centenarian study, uh, there was a paper published by that a little while ago, and there was a recent paper in demography doing this very thing of basically thinking of a two-by-two two table, and uh, one side is, is uh, physical function, the other is cognitive function, which comes next. So we're in the process of doing some of that work. But first, we wanted to uh, uh, start with the concept of dual functionality. The other issue, I'll just, you know, uh, tell you my thinking, is that, you know, we wanted to establish that there is a concept or there is a phenomenon called dual functionality, study the antecedents of it. But I... I show to you as basically a categorical variable, either you have it or you don't. Another thought that I have for future work is to peg it more to ages and think of it more as a quantitative variable. So if you're 65 years of age and you have dual functionality, that's a great thing. If you're 75, if you're 85, if you're 95, it seems to me 
that should be reflected in the notion of what we call dual functionality. So perhaps these would be the high functioning folks. And that might be another way to try to bring home the importance of being able to hold both functions. I think most of the evidence shows it's much more about physical function affecting cognitive function, but I've seen studies the other way. Great, thank you. Other questions? All right. You can the press the button. Um, your research is very interesting and very insightful into life outcomes. My question is, is why do these things cause the changes they do? Why does more education result in a better life outcome? Have you found anything about the physiological cause of this? The physiological causes are varied, and I think the first uh, uh, participant mentioned about epigenetic processes. There's a great book uh, by uh, uh, Morosky and Ross that talks about education as a resource and all the things that it does. So I think that you know it's a confluence of physical, uh, social, economic factors, but it all congeals in the sense that better uh, uh, health is associated with those individuals who you who uh, appropriate more education. Uh, Jennifer Karras Montes now is now looking at degrees that people get. Is a, is a degree in sociology worth as much as a degree in uh, chemical engineering? Well, I think you may have hunches about the, the uh, answer to that question, but clearly the evidence is that these things are uh, effective in, in uh, from a policy standpoint, from public health, um, there should continue to be this investment and interest in education to make a difference in, in terms of health. Uh, we know that where people consume their information is related to their educational attainment. Uh, their their uh, proclivity to avoid misinformation or to be able to understand uh, information that's coming to them that may be uh, suspect, that's another thing. I think uh, higher education also breeds a sense of confidence, a sense of mastery, a sense of personal control that, you know, if I can... Uh, solve a uh, series of equations. Wow, that, I, I feel good about myself and how to get myself through. So I think there are a lot of factors going on. I'm not going to pretend to know all of those that education does, but it seems to me that it's a powerhouse among uh, uh, resources to affect change. Thank you. was very good. It was interesting and insightful. Um, but I have a question about um, how, I know you compared education and wealth. Um, did you compare or did you uh, think about maybe the community involvement and familial kind of involvement uh, that is associated with the how well they do, you know, they're successful with dual functionality? That's a great, another great question. And I hinted that what our next paper is, is on uh, social integration and dual functionality. So uh, that's what we've got to do. And we have a rather rich array of variables in HRS. And we're, we're literally in the process trying to determine which ones we want to use. So we have neighborhood characteristics. We've got support and strain. We've got volunteering, uh, religious involvement. There are all sorts of uh, mechanisms that can play a role here, but that is the next uh, project, next major project. I indeed agree, agree with you in, in what you just said, and that is that social isolation and loneliness is now a very, very major factor in the development of 
age-associated morbidities. And, and it, 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 is, it is presently an epidemic in this country and in, mm -hmm. the other, and, and in countries that are uh, 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 well, uh, have, uh, well, uh, uh, well, the important industrial com countries, so to speak. And it has initially been shown to be especially important in um, the elderly. But with the epidemic, the COVID epidemic, and with the isolation of youngsters with the COVID epidemic, we are now seeing the same uh, 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 problems with younger people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you uh, stated well that it really is an epidemic. Uh, we are experiencing a very rapid social change. I remember in the 70s, there was a book called Future Shock by Alvin Toffler. And, you know, his idea was that the pace of change was so rapid. Well, this was before, uh, you know, personal computers. And, and where we are today in terms of social media, is social media making people more connected? Or is it making people feel less connected? There's a lot of evidence that says, actually, it could be uh, exacerbating the problem of loneliness. Uh, so... You're right. It's a life course issue. It's not just older adults. Um, we've grown accustomed to the convenience of you can zoom in a speaker or you can have your classes online. And I'm not against the use of those technologies, but we need a little more of Coco's Marquis Day's hospitality and you know, just greeting people and thinking of others in a generative way to build one another up. Uh, I know that's not exactly a scientific statement. It's much more an observation of a sociologist who sees a society that's hungry for social engagement. I think with that, we're going to thank you again, Dr. Ferraro. That was a really insightful talk. And we can't wait for you to come back and share your social integration data at a future talk. And we welcome you back thank anytime. You. Thank you so much. And, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Ferraro. Rebecca. So for I'll write to you, room, Ken, with my question. Oh, Rebecca, I'm sorry. Did I no, that's you? okay. I'll write to you. No, no, no. no. <laughs> All right. It's all right. Thanks, Dr. Ferraro, Thank for you. those in the room. There's drinks and food outside. Thanks for attending. You're going to be having cocktails on um, and toasting to you.